Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to MCMC and to the organizers for the opportunity to be here. As I'm the last speaker before lunch, I could short circuit this presentation by telling you the answer, which is yes, based on the international scientific community. But perhaps you'll give me a few minutes to provide some of the evidence why the answer is yes. Um, I've been 30 years involved in this issue, and we've seen similar concerns through analog deployment, 2G, 3G, 4G deployment. And that's also given us some information about how to respond to those concerns. A lot of that evidence related to earlier mobile systems, to broadcast systems, to radar systems, have helped inform the safety standards that apply also for 5G. What's different in the 5G environment is this technology that's given us so many opportunities, as we heard in the whole morning session, has also given some new challenges. There's a quote in various forms that goes back to the 1700s, which goes along the lines of, falsehood will travel halfway around the world before truth can get out of bed. And Twitter and Facebook and other platforms have amplified that in the 5G context in terms of addressing misinformation. Why are we talking about this issue? Uh, as the introduction said, there is community interest in it. We've talked a lot about the need for Spectrum to deploy 5G, but we also have to be able to build the infrastructure. And community acceptance of that infrastructure is going to be critical to that build out. So at its most basic, electromagnetic fields uh, naturally occur in the environment. Uh, the remnants of the Big Bang provide radio signals from the microwave band at very low uh, intensities. Many other natural sources of electromagnetic energy, the sun, is the primary source. And we can make a broad distinction in that electromagnetic spectrum between what's shown in red on the slide, which is called ionizing, where the energy can cause direct genetic damage and potentially trigger cancer, and non-ionizing, where the mechanism doesn't exist to do that and can interact with the body in other ways. We do have safety standards for radio signals. If you look at the World Health Organization documents, the first studies of safety relate to the introduction of radar in the 1930s. Uh, we have sta safety standards in place since the 1950s and 1960s in many countries, and they've kept being updated as the science has developed over time. What they show is that for radio signals, is that if you have a very intense exposure, it can cause heating of the body. And that's fundamentally the mechanism that operates in your microwave oven if you have it at home. And so what the standards do is ensure that the amount of energy we're exposed to cannot cause detectable heating in the body. And they create the protection limits for exposure. One of the myths that's around on the internet is that this is an area that has not been studied. Well, in fact, from the World Health Organization point of view, there is more study on electromagnetic fields in general than most of the chemicals in use in everyday environment. And in particular, if you talk about the, the broad range of frequencies between 0 hertz and 300 gigahertz, this database uh, EMF portal in Germany lists almost 30,000 publications and nearly 3,000 specific to mobile communications, and over 350 specific to millimeter waves. And we've heard a little bit about millimeter waves before. So obviously, in 20 minutes, I cannot review uh, 30,000 studies or even 3,000 studies. So I'm just going to show you one graph that is, I think, very informative in terms of addressing the myths that are out there. Before I do that, I want to point out that there have been regular and ongoing reviews of this scientific evidence. If you look at the early reviews in the 1970s, they were looking at use of microwaves in heating. They were looking at police use of portable radar and other type applications. As we moved into the 90s and early 2000s, there's been a lot of focus on uh, mobile communication type frequencies specifically. And if you go on the GSMA website, we have a listing of well over 100 reports by different expert groups in different countries around the world who have looked at this scientific literature. The most recent report was published by the Swedish expert group uh, towards the end of last year, and I've got the quotation there on the slide. No new causal relationship between EMF exposure and health risks has been established, 
and therefore the standards that exist remain protective. And Malaysia has adopted the same international standards as Australia, the European Union, and most countries around the world. And those standards apply for all the mobile frequencies, including all the frequencies used for 5G. This is the, the graph I was talking about. So this is looking at brain cancer trends. And most people will have seen stories on the internet or in newspapers saying that if you use your mobile phone, it increases your risk of brain cancer. And the data really does not support this. So the, the vertical bars you see on the chart are US cellular subscriber numbers. And the blue wavy line is brain cancer trends. And you can see between 1975 and the early, late 1980s, there seemed like there was an increase. That increase was associated with the introduction of MRI, better detection of brain cancer, not a radio signal. But as you look from beyond that, you do not see an increase in risk in brain cancer. And if there was a real effect from mobile phone use, we should be seeing it. There's cancer trend studies now from several countries around the world with at least 15 years of mobile phone use, and they do not see any increase in brain cancer. This is one of the most compelling graphs in terms of trying to understand the scientific literature. The other myth that's out there is this idea that exposure has increased. So we think everyone's using a mobile phone, there's more antenna sites, then exposure must have increased. Well, the fact is it doesn't. One of the things we've seen with the evolution of technology is much more efficient use of radio signals. So a 3G phone or a 4G phone operates at about 1% of its maximum power most of the time. A GSM phone, by comparison, operated about 50% of its maximum power. And with 5G, we've got further technology improvements to uh, improve, again, further that energy efficiency. This chart summarizes a study that was published recently, which looked at measurement data from multiple countries across Europe through both uh, measurements of base stations and giving people a personal exposimeter, which they could wear as they go around their daily life and, and would monitor their exposure. So 14, 7, 47 measurement studies involved. And they've concluded two things which I think are important to take away. First off, no real change in individual exposure, certainly since 2012 when the last review was done. And no difference in personal exposure in countries that followed the international limits or countries that followed restrictive limits. And that's a really important conclusion because we've sometimes seen political pressure to have uh, restrictive limits, but they don't change exposure. What they do is they make it more difficult to deploy mobile networks. And this is a topic that's under discussion. Several European countries who are identifying that restrictive limits are a barrier to 5G deployment. And we've had the situation of Poland, which as of the 1st of January has moved from old Soviet restrictive limits to the international ones because they want to see 5G rolled out efficiently. This graph shows a number of countries, and you'll see Malaysia, uh, on the bottom line there, and organizations such as the European Commission or the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, who have issued statements to the effect that no health risks are expected from 5G. And this group, this list is growing. I picked up a, a report from Italy uh, just yesterday. So this consistent theme that we're seeing. And the kind of statements they're saying is that the existing exposure limits apply to 5G and all those frequencies that, as it says in the Australian uh, quote, that our understanding of the science hasn't changed with 5G. And this is something that's important to understand. The standards designed to protect people, they're not technology specific. So the technology must comply with the standard. Uh, and the analogy I use for that is, is sound levels. So there are sound level protection standards in place that protect your hearing whether you go to a rock concert or you stand near a jet engine. It's the same sort of thing with, with 5G and other mobile technologies. They have to comply with the international standards. As the UK points out, many of the frequencies used for 5G have been used for other uh, applications, in the, both in the telecom space and in other spaces, as I'll talk about. And you see the quote from the MCMC from, from uh, earlier this year, earlier last year, around the deployment in uh, Malaysia. And I think this is really important to emphasize the role that 
government agencies as trusted authorities have in communicating accurate information. For, uh, so small cell deployment is going to be one of the features of 5G, both because of the higher frequency bands that are be used in some applications, as we've heard from speakers, but also because if we want to have much higher data rates, we need to be closer to the antennas. Uh, and video uh, is one of the applications that's in the future. Uh, the ANFR, which is the French Spectrum Agency, have been involved in a 4G small cell measurement study over the last couple of years, where they looked at uh, measurements near the sites, and they found three main conclusions. First off, small cells increase the data rate available, both download and upload from the, the user. They reduce the power of the mobile phone because it's closer to the antenna site. And the exposure level from the small cells is about the same as the macrocytes. And the exposure level for macrocytes is typically between 1,000 and 10,000 times lower than the limit values. So even adding small cells does not change the levels of exposure in the community. And in fact, in the ANFR measurements, they were unable to distinguish the small cell network signal from the broader networks if they were more than 100 meters away from the small cell site. So very low levels and, and doesn't really change much in terms of the environment. The other technological um, innovation related to this, uh, 5G is the increased use of smart antenna technologies. I, I say increased because they are already in use in 4G networks. We have already MIMO antennas. The move to higher frequencies will allow additional complexity and additional uh, sophistication in those antennas. And the big thing that they do is they direct the energy, the data, to the person who wants to make the call. And so by shifting that beam around, it means you get a high quality connection, high speed connection when you need it, and then it switches to somebody else when they need to make the call. And so that reduces the energy in other directions and can also reduce interference. But from a measurement and compliance point of view, it means that there is much more variability because rather than traditional idea, which is a base station like the, the lights at the end of the room that illuminate the whole room, we're talking about a floodlight that turns on, provides a beam, switches off, or goes to somewhere else. And so new techniques have been developed by the standards bodies to do the assessments. ANFR, again, that French spectrum agency, has been at the forefront of working on electromagnetic field issues related to 5G, because it's one of the things that they identified that they needed to resolve in order to address public acceptance. And so this is a, a table from a report they published about October last year, which compares exposures from 4G and from 5G. So 4G, they've got two scenarios, a typical site or a future site, a high capacity site, and similarly for 5G, a low data rate site, a high data rate site. And if you look at the numbers in the table, you see the powers are about the same, so that's the first line. The second line, the gain is higher with smart antennas, the MIMO, because they have this greater directivity. But the third line then, attenuation, this refers to the fact that even for a 4G antenna site, the antenna doesn't transmit constantly. It transmits when and where it's needed. And so you get this roughly 4 dB or about 40% reduction between the, real, the theoretical maximum and the actual uh, exposure, sorry, 60% reduction between the real max, sorry, the theoretical maximum and the real exposure. When we turn to the 5G case, the use of beam steering, the redirection means we get a much higher attenuation. So that when we get, and then the, the TDD mode, which is used in 5G, means that if you focus on the bottom line, exposures roughly the same from 4G or 5G. So it's not going to change the exposure environment significantly. There's been a lot of misunderstanding about millimeter waves as well, and we've seen this in, in a number of markets. So these aren't new. These are frequencies used, as I said already, for mobile services but they're also used uh, for radar. Uh, they're used in uh, security scanners. So if, I, I know when I came from, from Australia to here, my bag went through an X-ray scanner. I went through a millimeter wave scanner for, for security purposes at the airport. 
In Eastern Europe in particular, there are a lot of use of millimeter waves at about 10 times the public exposure limit for medical therapies. Uh, they're widely accepted in, in Eastern Europe in terms of their effectiveness. Uh, in other parts of the world, they're not so popular. And there's also been a, an application on lethal crowd control. As you can see from this graph, most of the energy from millimeter waves is absorbed quite superficially in the outer layers of the skin. And as we go up higher in frequency, that absorption becomes more and more superficial. Which gives us back that the main biological effects, as with the lower levels or lower frequencies, are related to heating. And that's why the standards are placed for protection of limits both in the skin and the eye. We saw emerging concerns around this issue in 2017. So GSMA published the first booklet, 5G Internet of Things and Wearable Devices. We just published an update of it in October last year. And this is a Q&A format, trying to address the, the questions that we've seen. We've got a fact sheet available in 12 languages on 5G and EMF that you can download from our website. We've produced an animation, we've written blogs and others, and we've given multiple presentations because we think it's really important to uh, address these concerns and ensure there's access to reliable information. The ITU also has a series of recommendations and information documents addressing 5G and EMF. The, the first one, uh, Supplement 9, talks about the technology generally and tries to act, uh, address some of the questions at that time. The middle one, Supplement 14, looks at how restrictive limits can make it more difficult to deploy both 4G and 5G. And Supplement 16 talks about how to assess 5G sites. And there are plans to update the IT EMF guide uh, in this year with further information on 5G. And I know uh, MCMC has translated that uh, to Malay, so this is something that you might want to consider as a future update. So some conclusions. We see this consistent message from international health agencies that the frequencies and modulations relevant to 5G are covered by the same protection standards, and no health hazards are expected, provided we comply with those safety standards. The assessments show that the exposures from 5G networks are quite similar to existing mobile and Wi-Fi technologies and a very small fraction of the limits, and we won't see that change significantly going forward. And in terms of millimeter waves, uh, these frequencies have already been used extensively, and they are also covered by those same safety standards. So I think it's really important that I let you all go to lunch. That was my key objective I was given in terms of this talk. So I want to say thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to sort of further discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Jack Rowley, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you.